So we see so many things going on around us that we know you are grieved over. Things that are contrary to your word, things that even attack your word, things that sow destruction and discord and even evil. So we pray, Lord, for our community. We pray for our schools. We pray for where we work. We pray for our state and our town. We pray for our country. We want to see you rising up, Lord, in a mighty way exercising your power, building your kingdom, glorifying your name. So help us to know how all that works in these desperate times. We seek you, we long for you, and we will follow you and obey your word as you lead us and tell us what to do. God, we do lift up to you today situations, difficulties, and people, things that we hurt over, things that we grieve over, things that we've done we know we shouldn't have done, things that we need to repent of. Forgive us of our sins, God. We also lift up to you, though, others that we're concerned about, that we love, people that are hurting, that need healing, that need medical help and spiritual help, mental help, and just a friend to stand beside them. We pray for those people. We ask that you would bring uh, the resources and the ministry Help us to know our job to minister to them. And God, we pray as we look at your word, we are open to your word. And we receive what you would say to us with the heart of a a servant, of a disciple. We ask all this in Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. We're starting in a whole new direction today. It's a little bit of um, enthusiasm on my part, a lot of um, anticipation, and a little bit of hesitation uh, because we're going to work through the book of Revelation. Yay, Pastor Tracy! Good, good job. We're we're gonna we're gonna work through the book of Revelation. You might clap now. I hope you'll still be clapping when we get to the end of this. Revelation is 22 chapters. Uh, To work through it is going to take more than 22 sermons. I really have prayed um, deeply to try and know. I've been wanting to do this a while. I thought maybe we ought to wait long enough till hopefully you trust me. Um, because Revelation can be very difficult. It is by far the most challenging book in the whole Bible. The most challenging to understand, that's because of so many confusing descriptions, often in very strong symbolic language. The symbols are on every page, and so symbolism leaves the door wide open for various kinds of interpretations. Also, because it's the last book in the Bible, um, it's the final chapter, it's the end of the end, and we all want to know how it ends, what comes next, what's going to happen ahead of us. Also, because of the nature of prophecy, that makes Revelation very difficult, because when you're looking at prophecy that has not been fulfilled yet, there always has to be a maybe, maybe not. Now, I don't mean maybe it's going to happen, maybe it's not going to happen. Certainly, if the Bible says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. What I mean, though, is maybe this way, maybe that way. Not will it happen, but how will it be fulfilled? So anytime you study prophecy, my conviction is it's got to come with maybe God can do it this way, maybe God can do it that way, maybe God will do it however he wants to, and we don't even get to know until it happens, and then we can say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I think I've told you before, um, with the first coming of Christ, everybody was looking for it. All of the Jews had taught it and examined it and interpreted it to the greatest extent they could, and none of them thought it was Jesus. Okay, When Jesus was there, none of them said, oh yeah, obviously, that that's him. Now, they came to that clearly, and the disciples had to develop their faith to that. But you know how many times Jesus said something, did something, and the disciples said, wait a minute, who, who is this? What is he doing? What does this mean? There was a lot of confusion in the prophecies of the first coming. Guess what? There is a lot of confusion in the prophecies of the second coming. 
And so to work through the book of Revelation uh, takes a lot of courage on my part. You know, I, I feel confident in saying that to you. It's okay. One of the reasons I've shied away from teaching through Revelation is because so many people have heard so many convinced preachers who are very loose with the text making bold pronouncements where the Bible is not so bold. And that's my kind of summary of how I see so many sermons on the subject matter of the book of Revelation. And of course, you know, Daniel talks about end times events. First and second Thessalonians talk about end times events. Each of the synoptic gospels, there's a whole chapter where Jesus talks about um, what's going to happen in the end. So there's a lot of material a lot of information, and then there are a lot of preachers who take what's on the page, and they got three words, and they turn it into a DVD series. So that's very risky, um, and it makes me kind of hesitant. I heard one preacher say repeatedly in a sermon on the end times, my correct opinion is... That's the way he said it. My correct opinion is... Now, I understand he was sort of joking, just... Sort of. If you have to say my correct opinion, that means that you are acknowledging that it is only your opinion. And opinion and correctness are mutually exclusive. Those two terms don't really go together. If it's your opinion, you have no idea whether it's going to work out the way you believe it's going to work out or not. If it's only your opinion, you don't know if it is correct or not. So don't tell me, Mr. I'm right and I know everything about end time smarty pants preacher. So that's kind of, that's how I come at this, guys. And I think we need to just kind of lay it all on the table if we're going to begin a study of Revelation because I want you to know um, I'm going to tell you everything I've got and everything I understand and everything the Lord reveals. But I'm going to tell you when the Lord's not revealing, when it is maybe this, maybe that, and somebody thinks, or this could be. Um, obviously, speculation is fun in the book of Revelation. We will do some of that. Um, but that's all it will be is speculation and open-mindedness. Um, I'm convinced, this is on your note page, and I think it's, it's kind of the summary of all this. I'm convinced that the Lord has given us just enough to know what we need to know, and speaking with assurance beyond what can be plainly known is nothing but arrogance. Even Jesus said at times, I don't know. Even Jesus said that. And it's okay for the preacher to say, I don't know, or this is my maybe opinion, maybe not opinion. I don't mind the speculation, but we need to know what we're dealing with. We actually have uh, multiple concepts in the end times universe where the Bible describes vaguely, um, but you know as well as I do, we teach with great boldness and certainty. The Bible gives hints and suggestions and pictures and symbols, and somehow we bring a hammer into that and nail it down and say, it's got to be, it's got to be, it's got to be. And the fact is, we're not supposed to do that. Any good um, ex exposition of Scripture, any good um, hermeneutic of Scripture, the interpretation, any good homiletics, the preaching of Scripture, uh, any seminary class, they're going to tell you, stick to the text. Say with boldness what the text says. Where the text is not clear and bold, you can't be clear and bold either. You have to be able to interpret the right way. So the real challenge in the weeks ahead is this. I am certain that there are beliefs and ideas that you have about the book of Revelation that are more based on some guy's opinion than on what the book of Revelation says. Okay, that means this is dangerous territory. And I'm not saying that as if, you know, you've got some kind of problem. It's not a failing on your part. Rather, it's because so much of this world is filled with opinion and speculation and just quite honestly, salesmanship. Salesmanship. So we've got to be very careful. So that means some of what we're going to talk about is going to challenge you. Uh, I'm challenged. I think probably you ought to be challenged as well if we're going to be honest with the book of Revelation. The fact is, too, some of what I might say you may not like. And you're allowed to disagree if you can back it up scripturally. But we're going to be friends. 
Okay, we love each other. You trust me. You know my foundation and what we're going to be about. Uh, I'm convinced that if you're going to teach through the book of Revelation or quite honestly anywhere in God's word, you need to stick to God's word. Nothing else really does anything. So I think that's your greatest desire too. One other uh, preliminary I want to give you is just how um, Revelation has been categorized. That's the heading on my note page, Approaches to Revelation. We'll be done with all the preliminaries here, but I think these are important to understand because in the Baptist world, not only are there multiple interpretations, but in the Christian world, there are even vast, huge competing categories and these are the four categories one is called the preterist view comes from the latin word praetor meaning past people who hold to this view believe everything in revelation has already happened they think revelation is written in deep symbolic language about the events of the first century john wrote this book about ad 90 so the church is 60 something years old jesus has been um, gone physically for about 60 years and persecution is extensive from the hands of the romans and so praetorists believe everything kind of happened in that first century. John's writing with secret code about the government of the day. Uh, the historical continuous view is the second one on the list. Um, this is uh, taking Revelation kind of as a historic panorama. Um, dispensationalism is based on the historically continuous view. Uh, there are seven churches addressed. And chapter 2 and 3, we're going to do seven sermons. I don't know why I'm holding up four fingers. Seven churches. We're in trouble already. Seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're going to do seven sermons on uh, those churches. And some holding to the historically continuous view see seven ages throughout all of history. I had a friend some years ago, we were talking about uh, the challenges of ministry and, you know, why people won't be more committed or give more or show up more. And he said to me, well, you know, we are in the age of Laodicea. That is the seventh church. And they categorize by the ages representing the churches and what Jesus says to those churches. And it actually fits quite well. The church at Laodicea um, was a very weak church, a declining church. And this pastor said to me, you know, we're in that age and that's what the Lord has decreed for his church. And that's why um, there's not a lot <clears throat> more enthusiasm or commitment among people who call themselves Christians. So that's dispensationalism. I, I'm typically not a dispensationalist um, lots of southern baptists are dispensationalists that's okay we'll talk about that as we work through this number three is the spiritual or the figurative view uh, the best way for me to describe that these are liberals they don't take the bible literally they don't think that um, the the book of revelation is written to tell us about precise events it's more just general language to tell us to do our best and be strong and um, love everybody and stay stay faithful so the symbols all just describe um, f feel good concepts uh, we're not liberal we're not doing that number four is futurist the futurist view um, this is this is us this is the typical evangelical um, the book is written as a prophetic unveiling of the consummation of the age so what it describes is what's going to happen specifically in the future it's just described with such challenging language terminology images numbers and symbols it, it makes it very very difficult to be that precise okay let's dive into this chapter 1 verses 1 through 3 the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. This is the opening statement of the passage. It sets the tone for the whole book. I want you to notice it is the revelation of Jesus. 
It's not John's revelation. It's not John coming up with this. It is Jesus revealing and speaking to John and making it plain to John what Jesus wants the church to know. It is the revelation of Christ. Number two, it is for the church. It says in the passage, to show his servants what must soon take place. If you want to know the purpose of the book of Revelation, there it is. It is to show Christians what's coming, what is ahead of us, what's down the road. So who needs this? What do we need? It talks about hope and faith. Let me ask you a question. Um, We're all Bible students here. How many times does that combination or those terms occur in the New Testament? Hope and faith over and over and over again. We are challenged to have hope, to be sure in our faith, to believe, to trust, to stand firm, to stay faithful. Jesus said, do not become weary in well-doing. Paul said, press on toward the goal. This is the theme of every writer in the New Testament, to stay at it, to love Jesus, to trust him. The world's not going to be easy or soft on Christians. It's going to be challenging. So be strong. Have hope and faith. That's what this book is about, all of it, to make Christians know that the Lord is in control and we can trust him. The underlying purpose is to strengthen and establish your hope and your faith. Not so you can make one of those beautiful charts. Have you seen those charts? You can roll some of those suckers out and cover both ends of your dining room table. And they tell you every little thing they are certain of. That's not really the purpose of the book of Revelation. Even with all the details we are given, the purpose is for you to know, okay, even though that horrible thing can happen, is going to happen, the Lord's got this. He's in control. I can trust in Him. He told me where we were headed. You have heard people say, maybe you've said it, I've said it, I've read the back of the book and we win. That's pretty much a great summary of the book of Revelation. I've read the back of the book. God's in control on the throne. Everything is going to be fine. Thirdly, you see in these three verses the idea of testimony. So it's the revelation of Jesus, but it is the testimony of John. What that means is John's not making this up. He's not coming up with this off the top of his head. He he didn't read the newspaper and say, oh, no, well, bad things are happening. I need to tell the church what to do about it. Uh, He's not high, which I've actually heard some supposed scholars say that he was in some kind of trance-like state, maybe from some substance somewhere. That's just wacky stuff. It is the revelation of Jesus, and it is the testimony of John. Very clearly, another theme in the New Testament, I was there, I saw it, here's what happened to me over and over again, confirming to us the truth of what is in Scripture. Fourthly, in verse 3, you see beatitude. That word is not here, but when the word blessed is used, that's what that is. We call the eight beatitudes, beatitudes, back in Matthew 5, blessed is he, blessed are you. That word blessed is the statement of beatitude. And so John is expressing that. Um, In the beatitude, God gives you greater understanding, new insight into his work, and renewed courage. Praise God for telling us all of this is what John is saying. We are blessed to have received it. And then fifthly, I see great urgency in the statements that are made here. Uh, What must soon take place? How long ago was this written? It's about 1,900 years, right? And still, it is soon to take place. This is an idea that too many Christians don't hang on to for very long. I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody new in the faith. They get saved, and they're full of energy. They're dynamic for Jesus. They're so excited. They're stirred up. But what happens? Over time, they just sink down to a, to a rut, And they just sit on a pew and wait till they die or till Jesus comes. When the Bible again and again and again tells you we are in the last times, they started the day Jesus went back to the Father. We are in the last times. There is urgency. There is warfare. There is passion. There is energy and commitment that we're supposed to exhibit day by day by day. 
And the writer of Revelation is telling us what must soon take place. And then in verse 4, he says, for the time is near. This is coming. This is coming soon. And we need to always be thinking the day could be today. This is coming. Be ready. Know what to do. How to think. Where your heart needs to be. The book of Revelation, then, is a wake-up call. It is a wake-up call. All end times prophecy has this tone to it. Know with certainty. See clearly. Trust him explicitly and absolutely. Build your foundation so that when the waves come, when the wind blows, you'll be standing firm. It is a wake-up call for you to know what you're doing and to get ready. I feel like I need to say this now. And I didn't have this in the notes, but this is kind of my my big hesitation, my big reveal for the book of Revelation. Um, So I'm just going to go ahead and say it, okay? Uh, I sat through a series on the book of Revelation, listened to a preacher preach through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is built on this urgency for all Christians to get their lives where they need to be. And this pastor, about three times in every sermon, said... This is going to happen. This is going to happen. Get ready for this. But you don't need to worry about it. You won't be here. He said that every single sermon more than once. Now, you know what he's saying, right? The rapture's coming before anything happens in the book of Revelation. So let me just say this to you. Nowhere in the book of Revelation does it say the rapture's coming before the book of Revelation. Can I just be honest with you? And we have built a whole theological concept on hints and suggestions, and maybe, maybe not. So I'm just telling you, the timing of the rapture is not clearly described in the Bible. I think this is probably the hardest hurdle for many of us to get over. I'm just going to say it right from the start, uh, and we can deal with it, okay? It's not clearly defined precisely when Jesus comes back. There's strength in the way it's described. There's clear um, demonstrations of, of how it works. There is certainty that he is coming back. But I'm not going to preach through 22 chapters of the book of Revelation and us just dismiss it thinking, it's fine, I won't be here. Okay? You need to consider in your mind how you would prepare yourself if you are here. Right? Everybody okay with that? That's fair and honest, and we're going to work through the concepts. And again, this is territory where there will be opinions and and differences of perspective. I'm fine with that. I can tell you I hope one way just like you do. I overwhelmingly hope one way. But I can't dismiss the book of Revelation and say, all of this is here, but you don't need to worry about it. You need to know, you need to apply, you need to understand. And this is written to tell you to get ready, to get ready. So that's how we're going to handle it. That's how I have to address it. And I feel like a whole weight's lifted off my shoulders now. So good. Chapter 1, verse 4. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So this is the declaration of authority, the revelation of Jesus, testimony of John, and then we get the signature or the stamp of authority. Um, John is telling us in the typical fashion, grace and peace to you. That's a normal greeting in a New Testament letter. But then this is a very distinct passage because it's one of the few places in the New Testament, in all of Scripture, where all three members of the Trinity are in the same passage. Now, all three members of the Trinity are all over the Bible, but there are very few times where they're all three mentioned in one passage, but they are right here. So it is him who was and is and is to come. That's a repeat of the divine name all the way back in Exodus 3. Moses said, whom shall I say is sending me? And God said, I am who I am, which means was, is, will be. This is an identifier of God the Father. 
And then we see the Holy Spirit. That's that phrase, seven spirits before the throne. This doesn't mean seven distinct spirits. This is the first place where the symbolism shows up. Seven, divine number, complete number. Uh, this is the full Spirit of God is what it means. So the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and then the name is explicit, Jesus Christ. All three are affirming, declaring, standing uh, in the in the affirmation of the book of revelation so john declares uh, who is speaking this where it's coming from where the authority is then verse five uh, in the middle begins a doxology he breaks out in praise to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his god and father to him be glory and power forever and ever amen Look, he is coming from the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. This is a conclusion in the first chapter. These events happen in like chapter 19. When Jesus comes, he wipes everybody out opposed to him. Uh, he destroys evil and the power of that evil, and the master of that evil. But that doesn't happen for a long time. And yet John says, hey, he's coming. And he says it with the certainty, right? Like, look, there he is. I can see him standing at the threshold. He's, he's ready. He's reaching for the rack and getting the descriptive tools that he's bringing with him. He's ready. Look, he's coming. That's the affirmation and the certainty of uh, what we have here. And he's expressing this authority and then this doxology. I hope you'll see the gospel in this doxology too. Right here from the start, he declares again the whole basis of our faith. He talks about um, the love that the Lord has for us. Every good gospel presentation begins with, did you know that God made you and he loves you? Just as simple as that. And then he talks about we are freed from our sins by his blood. That is the death and the burial of Christ who died for our sins. And he made us a kingdom of priests to serve. That sounds like the Great Commission to me, right? It is the gospel. God loves you. He's done a mighty work in your life. A life changing work in your life. And he's given you a mission as a kingdom of priests, to serve him. And then he concludes the doxology. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 8 is where the Lord speaks, and he identifies himself. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. He's identified himself here, the Alpha and the Omega. I know you've heard this many times before. The first letter of the Greek alphabet, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. What he means is, I'm the starter and I'm the finisher. I am the beginning place and I'm the one who brings it all to a conclusion. Just like in Hebrews 12, 2, we're told, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And here, he is called the one who is and who was and who is to come, which means Jesus the Son is God the Son. This is the divine name from Exodus 3, God the Father, and Jesus the Son is God himself. He is revealing his divinity uh, and exp expressing that kind of connection back to the Lord. And he even says the Almighty. So uh, he's telling us here, don't get caught up in all the latest news reports. Don't get caught up in whatever you read last time on social media. My son sent me a, another video. He's been sending me, you know, um, like podcast videos of people talking about current events. This happened, that happened. And I just looked at it this morning. I didn't have time to look at the video, but he said his comment was, the end of the world has come. That's what he said. My son said that. Well, what the Lord is saying here is um, there is a greater authority that supersedes all of the stuff that we have to look at and view and think about and wonder over and, and lose sleep over. God says, Jesus says, I am the Almighty. All you got to do is know that. Every time you watch one of those videos or listen to somebody's opinion or hear this latest thing about the politicians that we're stuck with or the financial system that we're stuck with, <clears throat> 
or the, the rich men north of Richmond. Every time you hear something about how mixed up the world is, all you need to know is Jesus is Almighty God. He is in power and authority over everything in this world. And the book of Revelation makes that abundantly clear right in the first chapter again and again and again. And Jesus here says he calls himself the Almighty. The Almighty. Don't you worry about whatever's coming. Don't you worry about what you don't understand. Don't you worry about what the preacher said that you're not really sure if you agree with or not. Jesus is the authority. He's the Almighty, and you can trust Him. And then he moves into this first vision, which is his meeting with Jesus. He sees Jesus face to face, and every way that Jesus is described is this startling picture of how he comes and reveals himself. So let's look at the first vision. We've got just enough time to finish this out. Um, starting in verse 9. Uh, 9 through 11, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, I was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He was exiled to the island of Patmos because he would not stop preaching about Jesus. They thought they could silence him, and then he wrote the book of Revelation along with other letters. I was on this island on the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. I heard this loud voice like a trumpet. And it said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Here they are, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So I'm writing this letter to you, John, and you're going to send it um, directly to the seven churches. They really are representative of all churches. Jesus is talking to the church. He's talking to believers about what's going on. I think chapter 1 could easily be the most important chapter in the whole book of Revelation, and especially verses 9 through 20. It's not about the where, when, how, why, who, what, so forth. It is instead about the person of Jesus Christ. It's not about which nations or which armies. It's not written so that you can speculate who the latest rendition of the Antichrist is. When I was a teenager, it was Gorbachev. You remember that thing on his head, the birthmark, and oh, we talked about, you know, that looks, that looks like a six on that side over there. So much speculation and silliness. This is not written, really, for us to do that. This is not written for us to look at our country and wonder why our country doesn't show up anywhere in the descriptions of the book of Revelation. I have some theories about that. It does talk about nations from the north and from the east and the south. It doesn't talk about anybody from the west of Israel. Nobody. But really, the book of Revelation is not aimed at us figuring that out. It's not even aimed at us being able to identify the Antichrist so clearly. That's not the number one thing. The thing that matters most is who is Jesus and to what extent is he in charge? Who is Jesus and does he have the authority to pull this off? Who is Jesus and can he finalize our salvation and take us home to glory? That's what the whole book is about. And so we begin with Jesus talking to John. Jesus taps John on the shoulder. John turns around, and it's not the Jesus that he remembers. Now, it is that Jesus, but not like he remembered Jesus when he walked on the face of the earth. He says in verses 12 and 13, uh, the seven golden lampstands. Jesus was among the seven golden lampstands. You'll see when we look at the seven churches, each one of them um, is addressed as a lampstand. So the seven golden lampstands represents the seven churches. What does that mean? It means Jesus is among the churches. Do you know Jesus is present with us here this morning? I think sometimes, you know, we get kind of worked into what's going on or we get kind of bored with what's going on, unfortunately, or distracted. And we forget that this is a Jesus event in the presence of our Savior. He's here with us among the churches. And we see that described clearly right from the beginning. And then we see this vision of Christ in all glory and power. I'm going to pick up in verse 13. 
among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Now here goes the list. I'm going to try to cover each one of these briefly. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all brilliance. This is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild, brothers and sisters. This is not Jesus who came as a man, humble, and did not give any um, resistance to those who uh, crucified him, did not give any debate, did not resist. This is not Jesus, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. This is Jesus, after the fact, coming back to finish, to win, to reclaim, to get, have victorious um, conquest over the forces of evil that have seized power in this world. Evil is a usurping power. It is a dictatorship, a coup that has tried to take away what God has tried to do. Well, the Lord's coming back to set things right. And when we see the description here, it is all about that concept. The robe and the sash, they represent the wardrobe of the high priest. Head and hair like wool, white as snow. It's a reminder back to Daniel 7, verse 9, where God the Father is described this way. Deity, eyes like blazing fire. That means he sees you. He knows everything going on, and I don't think he's none too happy about plenty of the things that are happening. Feet of burnished bronze point to his purity, his voice like the sound of rushing waters, his might and his power. Uh, in his right hand, he held seven stars. That's about the churches, his care and his oversight of the churches. Out of his mouth comes this sharp double-edged sword. That's our reminder that the only weapon of our warfare is what it is the word of God it is the word of God everything Jesus does comes as a proclamation of the word of God he doesn't really even have to have a sword the sword is just a symbol of the power and the ability of the word of God it is when he speaks it is when he speaks you better believe it you can bank on it you can be sure of it it is absolute and certain that's why all of the Bible is true and clear and eternal it will always be what it is Hebrews 4 12 says the Word of God is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword there's our preparation verse for this passage in Revelation you see first uh, John 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God the word was God Jesus is the word Jesus speaks the word Revelation 19 3 he is dressed in a robe dripped in blood and his name Jesus is the word of God so the word is everything the passage then says his face is like the sun that is glory and radiance um, this is the Jesus that we are headed toward you better get ready when you get to heaven and you see Jesus he's not going to be I don't think exactly how we've somehow pictured him in our minds you know all those people that get this idea that God the Father is the great granddaddy in the sky and don't you even think that way God's got nothing to do with granddaddy now he loves you he cares about you he's warm and affectionate praise God that he is a God of mercy and peace but he is also a God of authority and holiness and glory and when you arrive there you enter into the presence of that glory and it will affect you it ought to affect you when you come to church on Sunday morning, to be honest with you, or when you have your devotion on Monday morning or any other time when you're tuned in to the Spirit. In fact, the effect is pretty similar to what happened to John. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John went, whoa, and he fell over. That's what happened when he saw. Now, he knew it was Jesus, right? But still, it was so vastly beyond anything he'd experienced. And he fell over as though he were dead. And the Lord Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. 
I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Uh, so that's what we want to hear the Lord say to us, right? When he comes in power and authority, I want the Lord to say, it's okay, Tracy. <laughs> Relax. It's okay. Don't be afraid. Every time there's an encounter, an epiphany in Scripture, if it's a friend of the Lord, the first thing the angel says, or the Lord Jesus in a pre-incarnate epiphany, the first thing he says is, peace, it is I. Do not be afraid. Re relax. So that's the same thing he says to John. But understand, John is powerfully overcome and affected, and then Jesus restores John, and Jesus reaffirms, I got the keys, I'm in charge, I'm coming in authority. And then 19 and 20 begins the instructions to write. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this is um, where we get our clear interpretation. If Jesus would have just been so kind to tell us every single thing in the next 21 chapters of the book of Revelation. But here he makes it very plain because he wants it to be very clear to us. This is about the church. This is about the kingdom. This is about the people of God. There is difficulty coming. There is challenge coming. And Jesus said, if this world is against you, take heart. It was against me first. There is difficulty. If you're going to live a faithful Christian life, the master of this world, the prince of the power of the air, uh, he wants to mess you up. In fact, he wants to wipe you out and destroy your faith and remove you, if that were possible, from the kingdom. And Christ is the fulfillment of prophecy, and he's coming to fulfill all prophecy. We have to establish in our hearts an absolute certainty. Jesus is the Lord and the Savior of this world. He is on the throne Everything is in submission to him. Everything hasn't admitted that yet. But the book of Revelation is telling you the day is coming. When the Lord returns, he doesn't come in humility. He comes in absolute authority. And he does what he always said he was going to do. The book says, get ready. Get ready. You cannot live a complacent life. You can't just worry about your retirement and your next vacation. If you know Jesus and you love him, you need to be working to commit your life to him and live faithfully every day. And you won't be distressed about the things you see happening. You won't be worried. You won't be afraid. You can trust in the Lord. You can build your life on his authority. And he's going to make everything happen in your life according to his will and his purpose. This is going to be fun. I'm excited. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We give you praise. I pray that you would stir a holy passion in the hearts of every person here and every person who watches this online. I pray that everything we're doing is about new commitment, new passion, new desire to live for Jesus. I know, Lord, there's a lot of distress these days about the condition our world is in, about what's happening in our own country. It grieves us, God. But let us stay focused. And let us be secure. That you are our only hope. And you are certain. And you are secure. I pray that you would build the faith of these people here. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And I do want to challenge you too. The book of Revelation is written for people who know Jesus. So please understand, you got to know Jesus before you understand it. And especially before you're on the winning side of it. you got to know Jesus. He did everything for you. There's not a person in this room or one who's ever existed that Jesus is not able to say, I died for you. So you have to confess your faith in him. I believe in you, Lord. I need you. Come into my heart. Save me. And he will change your life like you wouldn't imagine if you'll just ask him. And then you're ready to live for him and know him. 
I trust that's where your heart is. If you need to ask Jesus into your heart, I'm going to ask you to come and tell me that during this time of invitation. Pastor, I want to know what it means to be saved. If you need to come and pray, pray for somebody you know, for a situation. Pray in your own life. Lord, give me a passion in these days. When somebody says, I don't know what's going on in the world, you can say, the Lord knows. The Bible's clear. Let me tell you about who Jesus is. Maybe you need to pray that way for that kind of courage. Let's just stand together. Our musicians playing. And you turn your hearts to the Lord and respond to Him as He leads you. And y'all be seated for just a minute. Miss Brenda, let me interrupt you and you guys come stand with me here just a second, please. I'm going to introduce you to Benny and Trey. This is Benny. He is Trey's grandfather. Uh, they've come this morning on promise of a letter from a sister church. I have talked to them about their salvation and they give good evidence of their love for Christ and their commitment. And uh, they want to be part of Fort Creek Baptist Church. So we say praise the Lord to that, right, church? As a church family, we have a commitment to one another. It's called a covenant relationship. It's where you are able to affirm to Benny and Trey that you want to love them, that you're going to pray for them, that you're going to look for them and uh, be involved in their lives and encourage them to the Lord. Would you be willing to do that by saying amen? Thank you, church. And the covenant's got promises on both sides. It's uh, a statement of your responsibility as well. If you're going to be part of a church, you're declaring, I'm going to live faithfully for the Lord to the best of my ability. I'm going to be involved in what's going on at Fort Creek, and I'm going to serve the Lord here the way he leads you. And so we ask you guys to affirm that and say, okay. Okay. Okay, Trey. Okay. Gotcha. Good enough. Let's stand together. Uh, we celebrate their coming. I'm so excited to have them. I know you are too. I encourage you, please come along this way. Greet them this morning and uh, share with them that way. And uh, we will pray together. Bobby Phillips, would you close us in prayer this morning? Oh, so, sorry, Bobby. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, please fill out your welcome card. I didn't get to tell you that earlier. I meant to. Uh, a lot of guests here this morning. I'd love to have a record of your being here. Uh, I'd love to be able to pray for you. Uh, if you'll uh, just take maybe an extra minute, you can hand it to me, put it on the table. Um, but if you, if you didn't do that, please take a minute and do that. Also, tonight, um, th this is Labor Day weekend. Uh, traditionally, we hadn't been meeting on Labor Day weekend Sunday night, um, but we're involved in the Next Generation Revival Services and uh, tonight's our night to prepare the meal. You heard Brent say this. It's been in the bulletin, I think, three weeks. The Brotherhood is doing the meal, so we need the Brotherhood to come do the meal. Does that, that make sense? We need some of you guys to help. Uh, Randy, we, we got five so far. Is that what you're telling me? Or we need five? 
Five o'clock, that's what that means. See, I don't do symbols well at all. So uh, anyway, yeah, five o'clock, we need some guys there to help with the meal. S uh, six o'clock is the meal. Seven o'clock is the uh, worship service. It is under the tent. Going to be comfortable again this evening. Please come and be part of the worship service. The great man preaching, and I think you'll really appreciate that as well. So uh, be mindful of that. Okay, Bobby, pray for us, please.